Welcome to uh, Dimensional Data Modeling uh, Day 1. So, uh, Dimensional Data Modeling is something that is very important uh, to learn about. Um, throughout my career, I've found it to be more important in some places and less important in other places. Like, um, so, you know, I worked at Facebook, Netflix, and Airbnb. And for me, uh, dimensional data modeling was very important in my roles at Netflix and in my roles at, in my role at Airbnb. And it was a little bit less important at uh, Facebook, but like Facebook, I was more dealing with fact data modeling most of the time. So in that case, we could just use facts, right? And we're going to be covering that next week. But dimensional data modeling very important stuff and we're going to be covering all sorts of different things that i've uh, encountered throughout my career throughout this entire boot camp so that y'all will see that this is not just like some information stuff but this is also rooted in experience so yeah let's uh let's dig into this lecture okay so what's a dimension i think that's like the start of a lot of these things is dimensional data modeling so what's a dimension so a lot of people, when you think of a dimension, at least for me, I'm a, I'm a math guy, and I think of like, like, like one dimension is like a line, two dimensions is like a square, and three dimensions is like a cube. So you have like the kind of the, the dimensions of space, you know, you have like X, Y, and Z, and those are going to be the uh, different dimensions that you can kind of model space with. And I think that that's a decent definition here, but the definition here is somewhat different in the fact that, like, uh, there, you can think of a dimension as an attribute of an entity. So I like different food. For a long time, I was obsessed with lasagna, and nowadays, as I've gotten older, like, the cheese in lasagna just absolutely wrecks me. So, like, uh, my favorite food is no longer lasagna. It's kind of shifted, right? I like curries now. Curries are always so good. I love freaking curries. And so, like, but if you track my favorite food over time, you'll see that it shifted. My favorite food used to be lasagna, and now it's curry. So, depending on what day it was, my, that dimension is different. This is not the case for other dimensions. Like, for example, my birthday. That day... Uh, Regardless of like, you know, you know, I'm almost 30, right? And I would much, I would want to push my birthday forward, right? Maybe, maybe I'm born in 2000 now and I'm only 23. That'd be awesome. But, you know, one can only, that's only something that you can dream of. You can't really actually do that. So uh, it's one of those things that's called a fixed dimension. And there are other fixed dimensions. A lot of the fixed dimensions that you come across are kind of like related to either dates or identity, like, for example, when you signed up for dataengineer.io, you were given a number, and that's the number that you can't really change. That's your number. That, uh, the only way that you can change is by making a brand new account. And so, but the number that you get is kind of fixed forever. Same with, like, the si your sign-up date. You can't, like, change the date that you signed up after you signed up. So there's a lot of different uh, dimensions like that that are fixed. The nice thing about fixed dimensions is, like, they're easy. They're just, like, one value, and you don't have to, like, model them. It's just, like, a table with some columns, and you're done. Easy. Slowly changing dimensions are nasty. Uh, the, they are not really scoped for this lecture. Uh, tomorrow's lecture is when we are going to go into a deep dive on slowly changing dimensions. But... I wanted to mention them now because it's an important part of the puzzle here. Okay, so what we're we covering today. Data modeling is a very kind of empathetic exercise in a lot of ways. And that's something that I think people forget about. They always are like, how do we make the data the smallest or the most compact or the fastest or whatever? When like really data, the, the exercise should be more in like, getting data that's used by your consumers because if your data is really fast and really compact and no one uses it and it doesn't change uh, decision making then you kind of failed so knowing your consumer very important uh we're also going to be covering um oltp versus olap data modeling oltp in this uh, context stands for online transaction processing and then olap stands for online analytical processing 
So these are two different ways that you can model dimensions and they both have their pros and cons and they like a lot of times there's people who actually try to fit one with the other and they have a bad time. Um, another very important thing that we're going to be covering today is cumulative table design. Cumulative table design is a very, very important way to model your dimensions so that you can uh, no, his, you can have historical context in one partition, so you don't like have to every time you want to know anything historical about a dimension, you have to like query like thirty partitions. Um, I'm going to talk about the compactness versus usability trade-off because a lot of this stuff when you're doing data modeling is uh, like you have to. It goes back to knowing your consumer, where some consumers are down with having a more compact version that is harder to query where other users, like, they want just primitive data types, and, you know, you have to do, like, you can do select star from where, group by, and you can't use any, anything more complex than that. And uh, these last two are kind of connected. So we have a thing called a temporal cardinality explosion. I just like those words together. That just sounds very sophisticated, right? But one of the ideas here around the temporal card cardinality explosion a great example here is when I worked at Airbnb, I worked in price and availability. So um, in Airbnb, Airbnb has like about 10 million listings, give or take. And then uh, we needed to model the next uh, 365 days. So the thing about it is, is if you take 10 million and then you multiply by 365, you get a lot of rows. It's billions, all right? Like 3 billion. And so... How can you model the data in such a way that the, the temporal aspect of the dimension doesn't blow up the number of rows? So we can have a way where we can model all of the price and availability of a listing and it, keep it at 10 million rows and not blow it up to billions of rows by taking 10 million times 365. So that's going to be one of the things we talk about. There's a lot of different other use cases besides that one. I like to go back to that one because it's very obvious and clear. And then the last thing we're going to talk about today is run length encoding compression gotchas. So run length encoding is a very, very important part of the data engineering puzzle. It allows data engineers to write compressed data. And um, there's some interesting gotchas that we are going to be covering uh, as well in today's lecture. So... Buckle up. We're going to have a good time here, y'all. All right. So generally speaking, as a data engineer, you have four, you have four potential um, like people that are going to be consuming your data. And there's really a fifth one as well, but, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But uh, generally speaking, you are going to be producing data sets that are queried by data analysts. That's like the, I don't know, that's like the textbook example, right, of like the data engineer got, writes the pipeline, the analyst makes the dashboard, and then the executive says it's beautiful, right? That's like, you know, if you like look up data engineering in the encyclopedia, that first one is going to be the case, right? As you grow as a data engineer, you can get to a point where you're, you're actually writing upstream data sets for other data engineers. So when I was at Airbnb and I was working on pricing and availability, that was the case for me. So I was building a data set that then there was 150 other pipelines that would read from my data set. And that is what I was working on. And the nice thing about when you work with other data engineers, uh, other data engineers usually know SQL pretty well and they can work on things and they understand how to build stuff and they understand like how to explode an array or access a struct or all these different things. So when, you're, when, when your downstream consumer is another data engineer, you can, you can be a little bit fancier with your data modeling and like you're not going to get people crying, right, which is great. That is not the case with data scientists and data analysts. Like I've, I've been there like when I've been like when I've, I, I tried to hand them like a, a, a table that has like an array of struct in it. And then they're like, give me something usable. Like that's what, essentially what they said. And I'm like, I'm, <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, I don't feel it's that hard to do an unnest. But, you know, that's just me. Like that's one of those things where like I, I back earlier in my career, I had this belief where I'm like, we want to make everyone on the team as technical as possible so that we can have like the dream team. And then like, but some people that you work with just don't want to learn. 
they don't want to learn. So like you got to meet them where they're at, right? And that's like a piece of wisdom that you should learn as a data engineer right now, right? Is not everyone in the company that you're at wants to get amazing at SQL. They don't want to get better at SQL. They don't care about getting better. So those are two choices. Another, uh, another um, um, consumer can be a machine learning model. So this was one of the things that made my uh, job at Airbnb a little bit complicated was uh, the pricing and availability data sets were actually also consumed by a machine learning model because there's a mo model called smart pricing at Airbnb. And what smart pricing does is a lot of hosts on Airbnb don't even set prices at all. They let an AI pick the price. And so that was the data set I was working on was building out the most reliable and correct data on pricing and availability that was fed into there and all a bunch of other places. So in this case, when you have data that's being fed into machine learning models, how it's fed in really depends, right? Where like sometimes you need it to be like a vector, like a vector, but like it all depends on like also the downstream consumers and like how technical they are and like where they're at. Like, you might need to turn your data sets into features and into a feature store. That can be another thing that uh, you need to go to. That was where I met uh, the machine learning engineers at Airbnb was we met in the middle for smart pricing where I had my smart pricing master data. And then I, we, we, we collaborated on building out features and then we built a feature store data set and that was what they read from. But I actually owned that feature store data set because I had more of the context around it. And uh, then you have customers. So customers, uh, you don't give them a data set ever, right? You're not going to be like, hey, customer. Well, the, the, there is an exception here. And that's if you're running a data engineering boot camp and you're teaching people SQL and then uh, you want to give them data sets. I'm not going to give you guys a chart, even though you're my customers. You guys get um, the raw data sets and you get a query stuff. So, but generally speaking, um, uh, for every other business besides my business, uh, you're going to want your customers to have a very easy to inter interpret chart, a very simple line chart, some bar charts. Like, it's got to be quick and easy and reliable, and that's going to be uh, how you do it. Um, then you have, uh, uh, I'm sure one, some of y'all might be thinking, well, what about the executives? What about like the leaders in the company, right? Uh, you can think of them the same as customers for the most part, that like you're going to need to give them a very easy to interpret chart. So like when I worked at Facebook, I um, worked on cross growth app, uh, uh, cross app growth there. And uh, one of the things that I needed to do was track the growth of Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, and Messenger. And what I did was I built um, a line chart of those four, four apps and um, I ended up getting an email from Mark Zuckerberg, and it, it said, this is the clearest depiction of growth I have ever seen. And I'm like, that's right. And so that just shows you that really um, you can take the customer, um, you can treat leadership kind of like a customer, where you got to give them just the most distilled version of the data. All right. So knowing your customer is super important, and uh, we will definitely cover that a bit more uh, in the lab as well. But so in here we have OLTP versus master data versus OLAP, right? So these are going to be uh, the three different ways that you can model your data um, with OLTP being the, essentially, it's optimized for like, if you want to look at one user's data or update one user's data, like all the queries that hit an OLTP system have like a where user ID equals seven, or it has like some sort of filter on those users. So, and you never do like, you never sum or like you don't look at the entire data set. That's not the purpose of it. Like, and with OLTP, you might be using a system like MySQL or a system like Postgres or SQL Server or something like that, or MongoDB or things like that, where like things are like really, it's all about like single record access. And um, it's terrible for analytics. It's just terrible. Because like, generally speaking, if you want to use it for analytics, you have to do a million joins. And it's just like, you just hate it. You hate it. And then uh, OLAP is closer to what you have like with dimensional data modeling, right? Where in this case, you optimize for large volumes. You try to minimize the number of joins that you need to do. And you optimize for group by queries. But then like single record access is now slower. It's a lot slower because all the data is like together. 
in like one kind of group. And so that's why uh, if you try to do it the other way where you build your production systems on OLAP data modeling, you're going to have a bad time because of that. You see this low latency? That is where you're going to eat, right? Obviously, there are some people who are trying to solve this problem. I don't know if y'all have heard of like single store. There's like a couple other like companies that try to say that like they're this... this um, delineation between OLTP and OLAP doesn't exist. So I want to talk about the last um, version here. We have um, master data. So master data in this case is optimized for completeness of ent entity definitions and is deduped. So it's kind of like in the middle, right, where you have the transaction data, which is going to be uh, deduped, minimized, single record access, and then OLAP is like you bring in all the dimensions to make group buys easy and make analytics easy. And then master data kind of sits in the middle between them. And because master data can serve OLAP uh, use cases. So that's kind of like what you want to think about here is there's a continuum. And uh, that I, I've done this continuum in my career so much. And like, it's like, it, you just keep doing it. Like, I, and that was one of the reasons why I left. Cause I was just like, dude, this is like, this is all it is. This, this is like every, every job is the same and we do the same. So, um, uh, so one of the things to remember here, if you model your data the wrong way. So if you model your data as OLAP when it needs to be master data, you're going to have a bad time. Or if you model it OLAP when it needs to be OLTP, you're going to have a bad time. You need to match the consumers. Like, so there's two things here, right? Like you have those methodologies, OLTP, OLAP, and master data. And then you have your consumers and what they need. And so we're going to talk about like essentially what type of modeling really meets what type of user as well. So just remember that like how you model your data really depends on who your consumer is. All right, so here's your continuum uh, that I was talking about. So uh, for dimensional data modeling, this is literally how it always works. And it's, um, so you start off with, you have your production database snapshots. So generally speaking at companies like Facebook, Netflix, Airbnb, what they do is once a day, they will take a picture of production and they will put that picture into the data lake. And so you get, you get one example. And usually they take the picture at like about 6 p.m. Pacific. But that's usually because it's like 1 a.m. Uh, like London time. They do it like an hour after midnight uh, UTC. Uh, that's just like the general way that these companies work. And so you have all these production database snapshots. And one of the things that is a common error is people are like, wow, we have all the dimensions. We have all the raw data. We don't need a pipeline. Like, why can't we just, why can't we just keep querying these snapshots? And that should be enough. And the thing is, though, is that's where if you keep building all of your queries on top of just the snapshots, then you get all these, these inconsistencies because you have five data scientists who write, write five different pipelines on top of the snapshots and they all compute the metrics just a little bit differently. And then like, then everyone has numbers that don't align. So that's where master data comes into play, right? So really in, in the end, like you should have a rule at your company that analytics people are forbidden from querying production database snapshots. They should never query production database snapshots. They should always query master data. Um, it, obviously that's not gonna always work because uh, a lot of times at companies, the data engineer is the bottleneck on the analytics. But in this case, uh, you wanna take your production database snapshots and then join them up and merge them and dedupe them and consolidate and conform them. And then that gives you a consistent layer called your master data layer. And this is what I worked on at, well, at all three of the companies I worked on master data management. That's like probably like one of the most important things that you can do as a data engineer because this layer is where truth is. This is, this is the layer where trust is. And so you wanna make sure that you uh, do a good job there. And then master data feeds into OLAP cubes. This is where you get a lot of group buys and aggregates and you kind of crunch the data down another layer. And then uh, OLAP cubes then feed into metrics where you crunch it down one more time. And usually metrics are now like a single number for a day. And so this is the continuum. 
that pretty much all data engineering is based on. It all just comes back to this. So, and if you can master this kind of flow, you will have a good time. So that's kind of uh, the perspective that uh, is gonna, going on here for this continuum. And, oh, and just letting y'all know, there will be questions. There'll be time, a little bit of time for questions at the end of this presentation if y'all have any burning questions. All right, cumulative table design. This is what we're gonna go over in the lab. Remember those production database snapshots I was talking about? Like, you, you, you wanna track all those dimensions, but you really wanna track them over time. Like you wanna track them yesterday and today. And then you, you just hold on to all of history. So then you have like essentially all of your users' data, excluding users who like ask to be deleted or like, you know, any like privacy things, right? That's where you wanna be careful with cumulative table design is you do wanna filter out the users who literally ask to be deleted. But the idea here is you have two data frames. You have the snapshot from, or you have the cumulative table from yesterday and the snapshot from today. And you marry those data sets with full outer join. Because then that will give you any new users or any users that were deleted because they're not in today's snapshot, but they were in yesterday's snapshot. And so you get that full outer join will get you all the users. And then you hang on to all of history. It's great. Uh, this cumulative table design um, was is used at Facebook for a table called Dim All Users. Dim All Users is the table that I know of, at least in my career, that has the most downstream dependencies. So when I was working in growth, uh, Dim All Users had 15,000 downstream pipelines that read from it. So And it, used, it uses this cumulative table design as well to understand a lot of things about user growth. And uh, other things that uh, cumulative table design, we're going to go even deeper into this in week three on the analytics track where there's um, applying analytical patterns. That's another uh, week in week three after the Thanksgiving break. And we're going to be covering a lot of things there as well. So that's where you can track things like growth or machine learning model uh, labels. You can really use this pattern to track the health of your machine learning models. Uh, that was a big thing I did at Facebook as well. Uh, I monitored how well the fake account machine learning model was labeling fake accounts. So that's essentially how a cumulative table design works. If it, if it hasn't like sunk in yet, don't worry, I have like three more slides. So one of the things you'll notice is this is going to be two data sets uh, that uh, I hope makes sense. So you'll see the top data set is you have, uh, for every day, you have whether you have me, my name, and whether I was active or not. So you'll see, like, I was not active on the first, active, 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 not active, 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 right? And this is the snapshot. This is just like, was Zach active today? So one of the things that's interesting, though, is if you go to the cumulative version, right, you'll see that every day we add another value to the array. So you'll see the first one is the, the, they look almost the same, except there is an array of values. And then we add the true here. Then we add the true again. Then we add the true again, add the false, add the true, add the true, right? And this is, uh, but one of the things you'll notice is this last data set, this last partition on the seventh here has all the data, all of the rest of this data, just with this, with this data on the seventh. And it's a lot smaller, it's actually significantly smaller than the daily snapshots data. Because if you look at this last partition here, you only have Zach one time, and then you have seven Booleans, right? Up here, you have Zach seven times and seven Booleans. So Booleans are pretty small, so, and since strings are big and Booleans are small, uh, it actually cuts the data in by more than half. The, 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 the data volume here, like you can use just this last day of data, this one on the seventh, to answer all the questions in the past. And you can do that with a data set that is more than half, the, or that is, is, is less than half the size of the daily snapshot dimensions. So this is what Facebook does. Because if you think about it, like say you're on the seventh here, and then you want to ask, like, is Zach weekly active? Well, you could do that two ways, right? Like, and if you're, if you're using the daily snapshots, you have to query all seven partitions, right? Because you have to look like, is, was he active today, yesterday, the day before, the day before, all the way back to um, seven days back, right? And you have to look at all those days 
and you have to query all seven partitions of the data, reading in all seven strings and all seven booleans, and that is going to be uh, well, that's a that's a, a significant amount of data. Whereas, like in this design, it's different because you can just query this one partition, you can query just the seventh, and then all you have to do is look at this array, and if there is any true values in this array, you're done, and uh, you know that that person is weakly active. And you can query this, and you can get your answer querying half as much data. And so that's a very beautiful thing about cumulative table design that you can just, it, it solves a lot of really awesome problems, and it makes your data sets more efficient. And like, it's amazing. But it's not all like sunshine and rainbows with uh, cumulative table design. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit more about like what sucks about cumulative table design. Okay, before before we get that, let's look at the um, kind of a, a closer version, a closer look at like an actual diagram. Where so yesterday will be the cumulative table from yesterday, which might be empty because the very first time you run this, yesterday will be empty, and then today will have data. But uh, going forward, every day after that, yesterday will have yesterday's data in it. So you take yesterday and today, you full outer join them together. And then uh, you coalesce any IDs and unchanging dimensions. And then you calculate any accumulation metrics, which we're going to talk, we're going to be doing that in the lab today. And then we're going to combine arrays and changing values. In this case, the arrays I'm talking about is that like is active array in the last slide. We come, but we keep adding a new value to that. But like, let's go back a slide real quick. One of the things that you don't want to like with this cumulative table design, another caveat is you don't want to keep adding like more, like you don't want to have this array just like go on forever. So like at Facebook, essentially how it works is you only add 30 values to the array so that then you can look at, you can do monthly active as well. And you'll see that like for monthly active, this design is even better, right? Because compared to the old design of daily snapshots, you are now reading in 97% less data. And you can answer your question like, was this user monthly active? And you just read in this like one data point here and that's it. And you don't have to read in all those 30 other data points. So um, that's a beautiful thing about it. But also know that you don't want to just make this array as big as you want and make it as big as, and just keep adding. Because eventually you're, uh, like, this uh, becomes hard to render when you're like querying it. There's like, there's some other, like, you run into interesting usability constraints when uh, this array gets too big. So anyways, this is the, the design with the full outer joins, and then that gives you the cumulated um, output for today. So that's cumulative table design like at a high level. All right, so strengths. So uh, you can do historical analysis without shuffle, because one of the other things that you might notice is that you don't, like, uh, because all of the um, active flags are in an array, you don't need to use group by or join or anything. You just have to sum the array or look in the array and see if there's any value. So there's no shuffling. So, and since there's no shuffling, it becomes essentially infinitely scalable. And things like Trino and Presto can answer, like, can do billions of rows in a second because there's no shuffle. Um, you can do easy transition analysis, right? Because you have what the state was the day before and the day before and the day before. It's all like the historical context is all rammed into one row. So you can easily see like when users changed. So this is a common thing that they do at Facebook where like if someone was active, uh, it was active yesterday and they're not active today, that's called churn. And then you have like, oh, if they were active yesterday, if they weren't active yesterday and they are active today, that's called resurrected. And then you have like, they didn't exist yesterday and now they're active today and they're new, right? And then you have like, they were active yesterday and they don't exist today and that's deleted, right? And you have all these different transition analyses that you can run with this also with no shuffle. So it's also infinitely scalable. Uh, drawbacks. There's a massive. There's two massive drawbacks to this design. Uh, the big one is that uh, backfills uh, have to happen sequentially. So, a lot of times in data engineering, when you're doing backfills, 
you can backfill many days at the same time, right? Like you can backfill, say you're trying to backfill, like with the daily snapshots, right? You can backfill all, you can backfill 365 days at once because they don't depend on each other. But you'll see in that design, since this depends on yesterday's data, you have to pick a starting point and then it has to do that day, then the next, then the next, then the next, then the next, which like makes the backfilling of this, um, this design just absolutely painful. It's just incredibly painful because that's like the only way that you can really do this sequentially is like, and, and, and that's how this, uh, I'd say that's of everything with this design. That's the number one beef I have with it, with this design is the fact that it depends on yesterday. And the only way that you can backfill is with, uh, sequentially, which means that like a lot of times, like I remember, uh, at Facebook when I was doing this for, um, reachability, just like a notifications metric. I remember like I had to do this back to 2010. It was 2010 to 2018. And I had to backfill eight years of data and it freaking took three weeks. And I'm just like, why am I still backfilling? Why is this still going? Like, this is like the backfill from hell. Like, why is this going on? So like, know that that is going to be probably one of the bigger drawbacks. But if you're at a smaller company, this sequential backfill doesn't really matter that much because these, like this, uh, since it's dimensional data, dimensional data usually isn't that big. And uh, this sequential backfill is not that big of a pain. And then it's like going forward, it's great because then it's just like, once the data is up to date, then uh, the ne then the next day it's only processing incrementally, and you get a big win that way. And so uh, the efficiency gains that you get from this are generally worth it. The other big thing is around PII data because uh, generally speaking, like if you have retention for a table, right? So say you have retention of a table and it's 90 days, like you only want to hold on to 90 days of data, but this design pulls all the historical data forward. So the historical data that is 90, more than 90 days old will be in today's partition, which makes PII and inactive and deleted users a pain where you actually have to like filter them out. Otherwise they will be held onto forever. That was something that I actually was working on at Facebook. And one of the things that I, uh, was one of the big reasons why I left was because I was working right around the time Cambridge Analytica and all that privacy stuff was happening. And I, and I was, I was talking with leadership and I was telling them, I'm like, Hey, like we need to care about user privacy, obviously. And like, look at all these cumulative tables. They're all holding on to data from users that are deleted <laughs> and like they didn't care. Right. So it made me feel like I was like, wow, like this is crazy. They've since changed because they got like a $5 billion fine. But at the time, they freaking had not uh, uh, made an adjustment there. So anyways, that is going to be your two big drawbacks uh, in terms of your cumulative table design. And uh, I, I highly recommend still looking at this pattern, even though those drawbacks are kind of annoying. Okay, so let's talk about the compactness versus usability trade-off. So you saw how like in the cumulative table design, it's nice because you get um, uh, this nice array. The data set is a lot smaller. You save a lot of space. It's great. But the problem is, is then if you, if you hand that array to uh, a query user who like isn't very technical, they're going to fall on their face and they're going to hate it. And then it's like all of the savings that you got in the cloud, you, you eat because the employee time, the employee spends an extra 30 minutes and 30 minutes of employee time. That's like, okay, you just ate uh, all of your savings. I don't know, like, especially if it's 30 minutes, like every day or 30 minutes over like a week, then you got to make sure that like usability matters more generally speaking than compactness, unless you're at the very, very, very high end of scale, then that's going to be a different case. But in this case, usable tables, the most usable tables have string int decimal Boolean. That's it. That's it. You don't get anything else. No array, no map, no struct. You just get uh, your primitive data types. That's it. Maybe an enum and enum is right on the edge, right? But enums don't really exist in the data lake. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, uh, these usable tables, uh, you can do all sorts of summations and where, and like you can do all sorts of nice, easy things with them. 
Okay, let's talk about the opposite end. You have the most compact tables. Uh, I worked uh, at, when I was working at Airbnb, I worked with a very, very compact table. Uh, this compact table used um, a, a compression codec that actually made it so that it was just a byte. It was a byte blob. And uh, because it made it so, and it was, it represented the calendar. So like when you're in the Airbnb app and you go to uh, a listing and you can try to, and you try to see what days you can book, that is in like a very compressed data format because they want to make it as small as possible because they ship that calendar to every user and they want to minimize the IO between uh, the server and the client because there's millions of people running these queries trying to book Airbnbs. So the most compact tables, you want to use the most compact tables when minimizing IO and op and making latency, uh, minimizing IO and minimizing latency. That's when you want to use the most compact tables where like you don't even have columns at that point. You have a blob of bytes because then that gets, get, gets rid of all the extra dead space everywhere. And, but then you can't query it. The only way you can query it is if you use the proprietary or you use some sort of de decompression thing or like some sort of like decoding thing to, uh, to get it out of the blob of bytes. And I had to do that. That's literally what I did at Airbnb was I decoded the calendar out of this big old blob of bytes so then I could turn it into a more usable table. Um, obviously, like if you had to do that all the time, you had to use some custom Java decoder every time you wanted to query a table just because that was the most compact version. Most of you would agree that that sounds pretty freaking ridiculous. So that's why there's a middle ground. Uh, the middle ground here is what we've been talking about. Uh, that's why we use arrays. Uh, we can compact stuff down, but still make it usable, but it's not as usable. You still have to know a little bit more. You have to know a little bit about arrays, a little bit about maps, a little bit about structs. And we're going to be covering array, map, and struct in detail over the next couple days. Uh, and those are going to be the, the middle ground here is beautiful. The, the, this middle ground is where I have found a massive amount of impact as a data engineer is in the middle here, especially if you are in that master data layer that I was talking about, uh, about 10, 20 minutes ago, that's where you can see this middle ground has a massive impact. All right. So let's, let's dig in a little bit deeper here. So when would you use each type? Right, what I was saying before, the most compact is going to be online systems where you're optimizing for latency and, and minimizing volume. That matters the most, right? And then the consumers have to be very technical. They're almost always software engineers. That's why, like, uh, for me at Airbnb, they really had me be a, a, a software engineer, data engineer. I was kind of both. And I had to know how to do all this stuff as well. And so uh, you have, like, if you have the very, very compact stuff where it's like just a blob of bytes, that is, uh, you have to know a lot about decoding and codecs and all sorts of stuff like that, that like even a lot of data engineers don't know anything about, right? And so then in the middle ground, you have, uh, this is where you have like staging data and master data. Uh, this middle ground is beautiful where you have the arrays and structs. Uh, it's the most beneficial when your consumers are other data engineers or other pretty technical people like who also understand how to use SQL or you have data scientists who are pretty technical because data scientists like it, it varies a lot like I've worked with data scientists who like want the most usable and they like they get mad at me if, if they can't just do a basic select group by and but then I have other um you know data scientists who I've worked with who like are writing Scala, right? And they, uh, they know all of this stuff, right? And they're very technical. So you can kind of like have this middle ground that's great. Uh, and it, it depends, you, this is where knowing your consumer is so important, so important. And then it's like, if you have a lot of consumers, that's where it gets even trickier, right? Because then you might need to come up with a couple different data sets that are gonna answer each of their questions. Um, that was a big thing I noticed was like, when I was working at price for pri with pricing and availability at Airbnb, uh, I had both uh, a data set for the middle ground and the most usable, where the middle ground one was like listing ID and then an array of nights. That was like, and I, I said, okay, other data engineers, if you are writing a pipeline that reads from this data set, you have to use the array version. And then, um, and then I had a usable version that had short retention it only had like two weeks of retention where I would explode it out and 
what I remember I was talking about earlier, that temporal cardinality explosion. And then I'd have that very usable data set, but that was only for like analysts who wanted to query stuff and they wanted an easy, they wanted an easy interface. So that's where if you can build your stuff, you can have all sorts of different like angles that you can build stuff with. And that's where it comes back to really knowing your consumer. You got to know your consumer. All right. The middle ground. We're getting close to the lab now. So the middle ground here, uh, we have three uh, things that we want to talk about. We're going in the lab today. We're going to be covering the first two. We'll cover uh, the map type uh, on Thursday. Uh, the struct structs. You can think of struct as like a table within a table because it's like a data type that has columns itself. And like in, in, in Trino, we're going to literally use it. And it's called the row data type in Trino. So it literally is like a, a table within a table. That's a good way to think about it. Where each column, like each, uh, uh, each struct has like a set of attributes that you have to put in it. And uh, the, the, the cool thing about the attributes is the values, you can type them as wh whatever you want. You can even nest them or you can have a struct that has another struct in it that has another struct in it. And you can go like all the way down, like inception, like struct of struct of struct of struct or all, all the way down if you want to do that. Like I wouldn't recommend it. That's going to get, that, that, that's not getting usable. But uh, then array, array obviously is easy. You have a list, ordinal, a list of values. Uh, the values all need to be the same type though. You can't have like, it's not like Python in that way. You know, where Python, you can like have a list and you can have like the first thing be a, a Boolean and the second thing be a string. And like Python just doesn't care. Like, don't do that for your data modeling. I mean, you kind of can. You can cast everything to string, but don't ever do that. Just like have it all be the same data type. That's like one of the, like, that's why we're here, right? Is to have some consistency. Map is kind of like uh, the middle ground here where you have keys and values. Uh, but they all, uh, the values all have to be the same type and the keys have to all be the same type. And the keys actually have to be like a very specific type. They need to be um, integer, string. They have to be like a, a, a primitive for the most part. Like, I think you can have a Boolean in a map. I actually don't know. Like, but because that, that seems dumb because then you can only have two values. So like, I don't know. But like, I think you can have a Boolean in a map. That's a, that's a, I have not tested that. But um, so those are going to be your three types. And uh, uh, the three like complex data types that show up a lot. And we're going to be going over these quite a bit today in the lab. And um, you're going you're gonna to kind of hate th these words by the end of this week, I would imagine. Because like that you're going to learn a lot. And then you're going to be like, wow, I learned a lot about this. Now we can go a little bit details here about temporal cardinality explosions of dimensions. So um, this is... Where when the, the, this is my definition of it, I think is a pretty good one. When you add a temporal aspect to your dimensions and the cardinality increases by at least one order of magnitude. Um, so in this case, Airbnb, 6 million listings. Uh, if you want to know the price and availability of each night for the next year, you get 2 billion nights. And then you have to ask the question, should the data set be at the listing level with an array of nights? Or should it be at the listing night level with 2 billion rows? So in my experience, if you sort the data the right way, and then you have all the listing nights together, you actually get the compression makes these two versions about the same size. Uh, but there's a problem with that, and we're going to cover that in a second, around parquet compression that I noticed that was... Such a crazy, when I noticed that, I felt like some was a light bulb went off for me. But the idea here, right, is you can, you can put either data set and they're comp with parquet compression. If you have the 2 billion rows or you have the listing night with the array, the, the, the te or the 6 million rows with the array, they're actually about the same size. But we're going to go into a little bit more detail of like why you want to use the array. Okay, so... When you have nights, one of the things that can happen is, and this was happening at Airbnb, when you have this listing night table where everything's all nice and sorted and compressed and tiny and beautiful, uh, but then someone comes in with a join and then Spark is like, I'm just going to shuffle all of this. And then you lose the compression, right? Because then uh, the downstream data set 
no longer has the compression and no longer has uh, um, th that parquet compression. And then the, the size of the data sets grows dramatically because um, now you have 2 billion rows that aren't compressed. And so we're going to go a little bit deeper into like what we mean by that. Okay, so run length encoding. This is one of the most important parts of Parquet file format compression, and it's probably one of the most important things that you get for using Parquet and why Parquet files can be so small. So here is kind of how it works. So you see, here's a data set. This is the data set we're literally going to be working with today as well. It's that NBA player seasons data set. And uh, you'll notice when you do this with Parquet, what happens? is you saw how like there's all these duplicates, right? You see AC green is duplicated like a bunch of times. So what Parquet does is every time a value is repeated, it actually nulls it out and then it says this value is repeated five times. And so you'll notice because of the Parquet run length encoding compression, this data set is now, I don't know, like 80% smaller because all those big nasty string columns are now uh, gone. They're nulled out. So uh, you can really compress things down a lot. So that's gonna be, it's a beautiful part that like is one way that you can, as a data engineer, you can really have a great impact. So what can happen though, is if you have this data set where you have this temporal component, right? You have season, where like at Airbnb, it wasn't season, it was night. And then uh, what happens is if you do a join, the data set's going to look like this now. And uh, you, you see we still get a little bit of compression where you have AC green twice. But you see now uh, instead of getting an 80% compression, we're getting like, I don't know, maybe like a 15% compression. And the only reason this happens is because Spark shuffles up the rows. And this happens not just with Spark, but with any distributed compute engine. This is, this is going to happen. So that is going to cause um, you, your downstream data set to lose its compression, and that is going to be a problem, right? That's going to make all your data sets really big, and uh, that's going to be probably one of the things I noticed. Here, I actually created both data sets, the array of nights and the listing level of 2 billion rows. But the thing is, is like if you have the array of nights together, then if you do a join, the array is still kept together and you don't get the shuffling. And then if they want to explode it after the join, great, they can do that. But then all of the knights are kept together. And then in that case, you don't have, you don't have to worry about shuffling ruining your compression. You actually get, like your downstream data engineers can now read your data, do joins, do all fancy stuff, explode the data, and then like all like the AC greens will be kept together and you won't have this weird funky like shuffled state that ruins the compression of the data. So that's one of the big things to remember about like are your downstream consumers also producing data sets? Because if they're also producing data sets, you need to be aware of like how the shuffling causes the compression to change.